This morning when I came in the Palais, <clears throat> this is my 18th meeting, I think, I noticed a big sign of Sony, the new Sony Curiosity, Q Music, and I couldn't help laughing, <clears throat> ironically, because every year we come to meet them and we have a new music service with a huge banner, remember Napster, the legal Napster, eight years ago, with a big banner, and not a single one of these companies has been successful except the ones without the banner, and that's Apple. Okay. Because Apple doesn't really sell music, they sell devices. So in an interesting angle, you know, in the music business, we have tried for the last 15 years to tell the consumer that they should behave and act differently than we would like them. And so we launched services that forces them to be different than they are. And of course, now you can see what kind of success we have. So in this session, I'm going to try to show you some innovations from other industries and how we can transfer them to the music business. Uh, that's the concept. I run a company called The Futures Agency. And so it's quite simple. This is what we do. We listen. Uh, and we look at scenarios from the next two, three, five years. Uh, there's myself in Switzerland, about uh, 20 others around the world. And then we help companies reinvent and come up with new business models that will make them successful in the future. I am on Twitter, G. Leonhardt and Futures Agency. So if you want to tweet and comment while I'm talking, that's fine. If I leave you enough time to operate your devices. So I hope that at the end of the session you can have this effect Instead of putting your head in the sand, you can fly with a jet belt. And to prove to you that I actually know what I'm talking about, this is proof that I was a musician. Uh, in fact, I went to Berkeley College in Boston, which doesn't make you a musician, but, but it does something, whatever that is. So I had a career as a musician for about 12 years myself. And uh, this is me in the bathtub a long time ago. OK, um, to get started. <clears throat> Henry Ford says if he had asked people what they wanted, they would have said they want faster horses. But he built the car. He didn't ask people because if he had asked people, it would have just been the obvious answer. So sometimes we have to have something what I call foresight, right? which is to look one step beyond the obvious. Right? And that's, that's a very crucial realization because if you always do what is obvious, uh, you'll probably never innovate in the same way. The other thing is Edison, who invented the light bulb. He said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. So failure is just part of the program. It's part of the experience. I'm getting excited, so I'm going to take my jacket off. Like the Las Vegas lights here, that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to try to charge your imagination. Anybody know where this is from? You can win one free book. Play in front. Okay, get a book afterwards. I got one of my books. Oh, talk about books. All my books are free on the internet, except my first book it's called The Future of Music, which is now The Past of Music. But anyway, you have to buy that book at Amazon. But uh, my books are Music 2.0, which you can Google and download, and Friction is Fiction. Uh, and you can find all the stuff there to download, so it's pretty straightforward. So point number one, I live in Switzerland, the land of clocks and cheeses, and uh, not of WikiLeaks, but Switzerland has an interesting phenomenon called Nespresso. Anybody have a Nespresso machine? I mean, all women here, of course, love Nespresso, not for the coffee, but for George Clooney, who is in the movie. So. One of the lessons that we can learn from the last 10 years, you have to be a lovable brand. People have to love what you do, and they'll buy anything, for any price. Apple is the best proof. I'm an Apple fanboy. I buy everything from Apple, no matter what it is, how bad it is, how much of a walled garden it is, how early it is, I just buy everything. Nespresso makes coffee. Of course, the machine is cheap, but the coffee is like three euros a pop or something, when you put those ridiculous things in. But people love Nespresso. And guess what is the most hated brand in the last five years in the consumer market? Well, it's not really a brand. US. Want to take a guess? The RIAA. I'm not joking. This goes right along with uh, 
uh, Halliburton, which is an arms company that makes the weapons for Iraq, but it has a beef connection. So being a lovable brand is key because people will buy stuff if they trust you, if they like you, and if it's good. That also has to be the case, of course, right? But lovable brand, right? So how does your company, your record label, your publishing company, your agency become a lovable brand? Well, you have to do the right thing. You have to add value, which I will talk about in my slideshow. Eric Schmidt, now former CEO of Google, he said this at the, global, at the Mobile World Congress last year. Everything that Google is doing is switching to mobile, mobile first. The entire world that, as we know it on the internet used to be computers. Now it's all happening on mobile phones. So if you have a band or a label or a publishing company, you've got to get mobile. You have to mobilize your website so a website looks like you can read on the phone which is very simple, I'll show you some tricks on this later. Apps and all that stuff, it's all about mobile internet. Africa, Brazil, India, China will not go online with one of those boxes. They don't even have power in those places. Many of those places, not all of them. So it's about mobile. London Underground is now mobile. Uh, American Express has an app called Social Currency, where you can talk about your money problems with others and get advice. And American Express is hosting this platform of conversation. They don't make any money with this. It's just a way of engaging with the users. BW is solidly on the mobile. You can test drive the cars on the mobile. You can find the next place, place to go to. They have the car fixed and all that stuff. Really obvious stuff. Here's my own uh, website, Media Future is mobilized. I'll show you how that works later. There's a great company called MoFuse, which is what I use where you can take your existing website and turn them into a mobile site in like 10 minutes. If you have an RSS feed. Very straightforward. There's lots of technology. Google has a very simple engine where you can create a mobile version of your entire website using a Google code. Uh, all you have to do is go to this uh, web address. I think it's um, actually uh, just, just Google it. <laughs> mobile website by Google. And then you can put it in there. You can create your own mobile website. It's a, sort of a shortcut. Right? But it's a very simple way of doing that if you have a website. Um, apps, of course. I don't believe people will be buying apps in the way that we would like, like a CD. I don't think selling newspapers and iPads will be a huge success. And uh, it has been proven pretty much that the enthusiasm about paying for apps is declining. So don't think about this for money. But having an app is like having a huge door to what you do. My app, for example, Media Futurist, is by far the most popular way of getting in touch with me now. It has beaten email. People have my app, they see what I'm doing, they look at the stuff, they send me a note. And so the app is a very powerful thing. This is an app here by uh, the Museum of Modern Art. You'd laugh about this, but all of the museums around the world are developing apps to serve the customers when they're there and when they're at home. So if you have a club, for example, get an app. And it's now actually quite simple to get apps, mobile body and others. eBay, 40% of eBay's business is mobile. So you can be in the train and say, okay, I'm watching, I'm selling, I'm buying, and just you can do it all from there. That's really brought up the business. Global mobile app downloads, of course, exploding uh, pretty much across all systems. So Android, iPhone, hopefully Symbian, maybe. Uh, so there's a bunch of things there that you have to consider in terms of platform. This is NPR. Anybody here from the US? Okay, NPR is the most successful app in audio, news, and music worldwide. With one swoop, NPR has become the number one outlet for lots of news, for music, for radio programs, and their brand is huge now. And they're not even a commercial, in parentheses, brand. I think 34 million people are using this app. So, very powerful. The Guardian, of course, UK. Very powerful way of spreading the word, and it's free, right? How do they make money? With attention. They're reselling the attention that they're getting, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. So think of yourself like this. If you, no matter if you're a musician or a label, you're a broadcaster. You're sending out stuff. You're transmitting things. So that's, you know, it's sort of a man with an RSS sign here. Uh, here's my favorite app. It's called Type and Walk. Uh, <laughs> If you have done this, you know what I'm talking about. You can type on your Blackberry while you're walking and you can see the street in front of you through the camera. Uh, it, it's a very useful app. It's my favorite app. It beats everything else. 
Okay, here's an app that is uh, the, uh, I think it was the Angels Philharmonic. They allow you to go, and this guy is uh, Gustavo Dudamel, who's a, who's a conductor. They allow you to this, this app and become a conductor yourself using the iPhone. It's a game, right? It's, it's a gimmick. But this is by far the most successful thing they, that they have done to promote the symphony. Because people get engaged, they play with this. Having a different angle, you know, making it more fun to, to work with people. Audi, of course, has a huge amount of apps for test driving cars on the mobile. So that's definitely the way to go. Appify, just don't look to apps for money in most cases. There are some cases, I think, where you can sell it. But we have to learn what they would be. So participation, not just content. That's crucial. You can see all of the winning commerce ventures and news outlets today, like the Huffington Post in the US, the Guardian, the Sunday Spiegel in Germany, and others, they're all about participation. Voting up and down, commenting, inviting people. The New York Times now lets me have my own page on NewYorkTimes.com, where I can recommend stuff for people who are following me on the New York Times. It's about participation, not just about consumption. And of course, mobile money. You are aware that about 40% uh, of the world is what we call unbanked. Lucky them. They don't have to pay the fees. But basically, most of Africa and many other places around the world, people don't have banks. How do they send money? Well, they have to use Western Union or something for 15% or whatever it is, now all of the banking and paying is going to mobile. So we're using a mobile to make payments. And this is a huge opportunity at live events and stuff for music. So if you don't have a mechanism to be paid on the mobile, you should think about it. Of course, PayPal, various uh, payment scenarios and so on, this stuff is going to be around the bend very quickly. So think mobile money. Because guess what? It's an impulse buy. Somebody listens to your band at a concert. If there's a way to buy something with a mobile, they're very likely to do it if they like the app. And if the price is right, of course. You guys know what quick response codes are? Sounds very tacky, but it's really quite simple. It's like an image. Here's mine. If you have a phone that does it, here's my website. Um, you take a photo, and it's like a barcode scanner. And it takes you from this QR code to the website or the place that you want to go to. It's like a shortcut. Now in Asia, this is like standard. You go to a McDonald's, God forbid. You go there and you want to know what is in the food, also forbid. Then you scan the QR code and it tells you on the phone what's in the food that you're about to eat. And then you won't eat it, I'm, I'm sure. But in any case, you can find the information on the QR code. This is a really great way of linking people. So everything you do should have a QR code. In fact, now there's bands playing with QR codes as t-shirts, which is probably kind of overdone. But So there's a couple of examples. Adidas has a way of where you can scan in the store and you can pull out the information on your mobile phone about this shoe. Uh, airlines, of course, have this everywhere around the world. The newspaper in Switzerland, the bus stop, you can go and hold it up and it takes you to a website with all the latest news. It's like a shortcut, so you don't have to type, you just go click, right? Uh, this is uh, Japan on buildings, sidewalks. Uh, all that stuff is going to be, uh, along with this, uh, the, the future. So augmented reality, that sounds kind of geeky again, but it's not. Well, in a way it is, but it's really quite simple. Same idea. You have a mobile phone with a camera. You hold the camera up. It finds the place that it locates where you are, and it brings in data from the data points around you. And you don't have to click to see them, you just see them on the screen. It's very popular also already for car, which is quite distracting, you know, to actually see, the, see Wikipedia data floating by as you drive it. But here's a short demo of this. As you go around the room, you can, you can see restaurants or houses for sale or any of those kind of things, right? So 
So this technology will become a standard in the next few years. Very scary, in fact, because obviously you can also scan people. Which is currently, uh, if you use a thing called Google Goggles, anybody have Google Goggles? It's an all, <laughs> yeah, it sounds strange, but it's on Android phones, right? Where you can superimpose the data and you can basically scan the Golden Gate Bridge, just hold the photo up. It will say Golden Gate Bridge, Wikipedia, you want to know when it was built, boom, right there. And it's widely used for dating in Japan. So you scan the face of a woman, right, and you can bring up her profile, and you say, no, I don't want to talk to her, she's, you know, she's too old or whatever. Um, it's not actually a legal application on Google, because it's, it's borrowed from the personal scanning. Right? But um, this kind of stuff at a concert, imagine. You can hold up the phone, point to the stage, the guitar says, I'm a Gibson guitar. Right? And you can actually have advertising in it that also work with radio chips, which sounds geeky, but it's actually quite simple. Or you superimpose the, uh, the album release over the window of, of the band, right? So you're watching the band, and then you can see up here, latest album, click here to uh, not to purchase, to get. Whatever may be easy to purchase. Uh, before I forget, I'm going to have a download available at mediafuturist.com. Sometime this afternoon, you can download the whole thing. The slideshow, the PDFs, not the videos. So here's a geeky uh, version of this. This was last year or two years ago in Tokyo. What people are doing with QR codes. So basically, there in Japan, there are probably some Japanese people here, but in Japan, this is like total average stuff. Everybody does this, pays with a mobile QR codes, right? So this is a QR code on the building. So you can see which offices are inside. All you have to do is hold the phone up, and it will bring up information and superimpose. Now you see on the next screen, it basically brings up all the layers of information as you're holding it up. Next generation is like this. Uh, and it brings you this stuff like this, second generation. See, well, all the data is popping up around the building, right? Now imagine this for artists, for bands, for musicians, you know, for all kinds of things could be quite useful and very powerful sort of, you know, on location based stuff. Uh, near field communications, NFC. It's a very simple technology that says I have, you have a chip in your, in your mobile and they're all starting to have this. Yeah. And the chip says, I am so-and-so. If you want to talk to me, you can talk to me like this. And there's a process in place of security, but you can make payments with this, right, which is of course crucial. And you can identify yourself, for example, you can go in the grocery store, there's no checkout. You just hold up the phone to each item you buy and you walk out. That's, so those kind of things are coming. Imagine this for music buying. Here's an example of how that works. I just basically just say, okay, this is your shopping cart. I'd like to use my specialty coupon. You just hold it up and it, it identifies you. Your token is 916.40. Okay, I'd like to use my master card. So if it's, if it's this easy to buy something, a lot of people will buy stuff. Oh, if the deal is good, no, the value is ready. So that's the future of NFC-enabled commerce. This brings me to another story. Yeah, somebody, um, no, Big Sur, California, fantastic place, one of the nicest places in the world. There's this place, that's one of the most expensive places in the world, it's called Ventana. That's a hotel. I was lucky enough to be there in December for some reason or the other. It was raining the whole time, but never mind. I found this on the table. I put this phone to myself. Usually when you check into a hotel, they say, this is a hotel guide or, you know, ever trivial things, right? In Ventana, it's the experience guide. So just this already tells you, you're in a special place, you're having an experience. Right? So the lesson you can learn from Ventana, try to be different, call it something different. Be creative with how you actually flag things, right? Because an experience guide is, makes me feel different than a hotel guide or location guide or something, right? So, starting with that, right with that, I think that's a good direction to go. Here's our first Steve Jobs. And we'd like to show it to you today for the first time. And we call it the iPad. So, let me show it to you now. Why am I bringing this up? Because he's the master of experience, right? 
I mean, that's what we're buying when we buy the iPad. It's, it's not, technically speaking, it's not really a computer even. But the experience is what we're buying, you know, the zooming, the, the user friendliness, the design, all these things, right? That's what Apple is all about. It's about experience. So if you have a band or a label, if you're a publisher, so think about the experience that people will have with the music. That is what we're bringing back. So that's a very important point. To summarize, so trying, you know, if you're trying to sell something, you have to be unique, remarkable, bold. You know, if you're looking at the leading brands of the world, that's basically what they do. Uh, this is a, a, a channel called Fame Count. Uh, it, it measures the popularity on Facebook of global brands. Bands, of course, are also measured there. I think it's famecount.com. You know, if you're looking here at Starbucks, Coke, Oreo cookies, Red Bull, Skinnies, Victoria's Secret, Converse, these are all brands that provide some sort of experience. They have achieved some sort of engagement process. That's why they are successful. Starbucks is not about coffee. It's about what happens when you go there and you also have some coffee. Maybe I don't drink the coffee, but I go there anyway because it's internet, uh, free internet there. But that's a good lesson, I think, from Starbucks. Uh, Harley Davidson, experience brand. Nespresso, of course, we talked already. Old Spice, and trying to get into the experience economy. And here's something that relates to this. This is a Facebook page where you can give an R to somebody. You know, when you drink the Coke, you go ah, right? Or supposedly, I go E, but they go ah anyway. But um, so you can send this to somebody, and when they open this card, then they hear a soundtrack that says ah. You know, it's like it's, it's a joke, right? But it was one of the most uh, widely used things that people send to each other because it's using humor of some sort, right? So if you can use humor, you should because people remember that stuff. The most successful videos on YouTube, they're all based on some sort of funny thing, which is actually quite hard to come up with, obviously. You, know, you may find it funny, but other people not happen to me all the time. So um, next point of this, for marketing purposes, you know, if you're thinking about selling something or so, make a game. And here's an example from Red Bull. It's a very widely successful game that they cooked up in, in the States. Red Bull secretly stashed thousands of Red Bull energy shots all over the country, keeping them hidden from the public until now. Soon on Facebook, you'll find the clues that lead to these hidden stashes. Some are easy, some are hard, but they'll be out there in just a few days, waiting in cities, streets, and parks all over America. You find them, you keep them. Nine Inch Nails has done something very similar, I think, two years ago. A very, very powerful campaign about discovering stuff and actually adding stuff to the music as well. So turning marketing into a game. Uh, you will find that I think thousands of websites and, and brands will resort to this idea of creating a game around what they're selling in the next few years. And that will really change advertising as well. YouTube, the power of YouTube is not that we can just uh, watch everything and use it as a virtual jukebox, that's also good. But 78% of YouTube's traffic comes from links. People sending each other a link. Have you ever seen a poster by the side of the road that says, uh, use YouTube for free videos? Not needed. Because we're sending stuff to each other. That's the viral mechanism behind YouTube. So, if you want people to share stuff, you have to enable the sharing. You can't say, click here to buy, and then share the link to buy. That's like saying, okay, come and visit my paywall. Okay. Doesn't work that way. You have to do something that sucks people in first. And the YouTube mechanism is, of course, extremely powerful. Google is not making much money with YouTube advertising, but I tell you, in a few years, they'll be making that $2 billion a month on YouTube, because everything is switching to video. Advertisers aren't quite ready, but they will be. I mean, YouTube has an audience share that you would not believe, along with Facebook. Here's an example from Jeep. Um, Jeep has a, had a campaign, I think, three years ago called Have Fun Out There. And it was a place to where you upload all of your pictures where you had fun with your Jeep getting stuck in the mud or whatever it is. And to show people that off-road driving is fun, supposedly, right? you upload all your images, and the users create this campaign. And then they ran a two-page ad in the New York Times 
where all the pictures from the users that had fun were printed, the ones that allowed it. So this was a very interesting campaign. Viral marketing allows the users to actually drive it forward. Right? Very interesting campaign of how you do this. Um, anybody here on Tumblr? Yeah? Tumblr? No? Tumblr is an extremely powerful uh, thing, right? Unfortunately, it has a little bit of tech problem, just like Twitter occasionally, so you won't get a response from a server or so, because it's so popular now. But Tumblr is called Tumbling. Right? You basically just share something very quickly, but it can be a photo, a video, whatever you're doing very quickly through the mobile and the computer. This is EMI's website using Tumblr. The process of posting a Tumblr is like a little bit more beyond Twitter, like you know, 10 seconds. And you can share what you currently are doing. John Mayer is using Tumblr now. He quit Twitter, as you may know. For some reason or the other, I don't quite get why. He has like 30 million followers or something. Just along with Obama. We'll have a lot less in the future. But in any case, uh, EMI site, and here's a fashion site, and they're sharing the latest stuff right from the, from the event venue. Tumblr.com is free. Uh, the New Yorker has a site there, and it's absolutely exploded. This is my own site called whereisitgoing.com. If you feel like you're having a laugh, you can go there. Um, where I share funny images that I find on the web, I share on this website. And you may think it's all taken a hell of a long time, but it's not. Once you get into this, it's essentially just a process of, you know, just making the link and getting it out there. Anybody know about this project? It's called uh, Pepsi Refresh. And Pepsi took $25 million and said, what can we do with this nice money? We can find people with cool ideas to make the world a better place. You know, they must be from California, I'm sure. But anyway, they took the money and said, okay, anybody with a good idea can come in and donate this idea, like saying recycle books for the school district, uh, and build a new park here, or whatever the idea was, and then people vote to give money to these projects. So you can get up to $100,000 from Pepsi for a good idea. And this was by far the most viral idea that they ever had, it has nothing to do with the drink. Absolutely nothing, but the lesson is give something to get something. And that actually was without money too. So the Pepsi principle worked out great for them. If you look at the numbers, you know, now here's some of the voting process and the numbers are very successful in terms of the overall market share and stuff. So they funded about 200 projects and they got lots and lots of, of views and impressions from this idea. Probably the most successful $25 million campaign they ever did was this. Did people drink more Pepsi? I don't know. They would certainly hope so, I guess. But they became popular, which meant, for example, the bottling facilities, they would say, I saw your campaign, that's pretty cool, maybe we should talk about, you know, carrying Pepsi again, not just Coke, right? That was, of course, the intention to go in this direction. So here's a couple of their projects. They funded a whole bunch of stuff in New York. But here's the key sentence. Uh, Pepsi's chief consumer engagement officer, wow, what a title. Okay, what he says, he says, we want to become a catalyst in culture rather than acting like a big brand announcing something. That's a lesson we can take rather than going out there and announcing that something is for sale. Right? We can give something to attract people who would then buy, if you follow my drift. And it's not entirely easy, of course, if you don't have 25 million, it wouldn't be as attractive. But, of course, you can take a lesson and uh, figure out something like this. There's this guy in California who runs a publishing company, you may know, O'Reilly Publishing. He has a website where people can uh, read tech books, 4,000 books, on a flat rate of $40 a month. You can actually download all the books for 40 bucks and subscribe to the tech process of, of reading it every month. Uh, it's a very successful site. And he says, create more value than you capture. And he's a publisher. I, I can't even believe that. Create more value than you capture. So that's actually not easy. You have to figure out how you always produce more value, but I think that's pointing uh, into the future for us. Sorry, a little bit premature here on this one. This is why I hate these clickers, you know, you have to... Okay, sorry about this. All right, this is Leonard Bernstein. You see how he's conducting his orchestra? He's not doing anything.
sometimes, if you've brought the right message to your band or your orchestra, it will just happen if you don't interfere. So sometimes that's a way of using your fans to help you if you just lend them. Of course, that took a long time until you got to this point, so it's not entirely an easy thing. Right? But here's an example of Dropbox. Anybody using Dropbox here? Okay. Dropbox is an app, of course. Everything you do with Apple, you have to get an app and pay for it somewhere or the other. So Dropbox allows you to share documents and stuff on various Apple platforms like mobile devices and iPad and so on. It's free and then you pay extra. So what Dropbox has done is they said, okay, everybody who invites other people to Dropbox, even to the free level, gets another 250 or what is it, 500 meg of storage. So the sharing process, they reward me with getting more storage for my stuff for free. And that has led to a very viable growth. And it's also free to them because they already have the store, so they're just sharing it. This is one way of sort of rewarding links and referrals that you should think about what can you give people who link to you? What can you give back to them? Not just traffic, but also other things to figure out. Um, back to what I was saying earlier, I, I also run a little website called gert.fm. It's a bit of a joke, obviously. But what it does is it takes the stuff that I have on the web and it makes short URLs. Uh, are you familiar with uh, URL shorteners? Right, because sometimes when your post is like 150 characters, you can't post it somewhere it's too long, like Twitter. You use a shortener. So if you have your own brand, get your own shortener, your own name. You can use that with a service called Bitly. It's also free. So once you have the URL, it's not going to be you know, this long thing anymore or somebody else's but your own shortcut for example uh, bbc.in uh, and uh, for example people have this sort of codes and what's very popular is to use a last domain name like .in, .edu or .fm so I'm using gerd.fm as a shortener. This makes it easier for people to share your stuff. It sounds trivial but it's widely used now. So think about URL shorteners. Another thing, if you already have a strong brand, for example, a record label, say if you were Bruno Records or Motown Records or whatever, or ECM Records or so, you already have a strong brand, then you can ask people to share on your platform. Because they will actually share what they do on your place, driving the traffic. Here's a couple of examples. Kodak, Starbucks allows you to go and contribute ideas to improve Starbucks on their website. And they're getting millions of people doing this. Example also, uh, StarWarsMashups.com is a, a site run by Star Wars. People do mashups all the time, now you can do it there. And you can actually get films from them to do it. So facilitating the sharing process is also a good brand exercise, and of course, Holly Davidson again. Quick comment on this. Don't think about the paywall. This is the chart of the London Times. Newspaper owned by Rupert Murdoch went down in traffic 81%, heading towards minus 50, I suppose, um, where nobody's going anymore because there's a paywall. You have to pay to read it, which is not a bad idea if people were doing it. But it's not as simple as that. So before you think about making a paywall, for example, on your website, can people stream your music for free? They should. If you're trying to get a single deal, you know, to sell for uh, television advertising, you have to allow people to download your music because they have to cut it to video. So the less of a wall you have, the more fluid it becomes, but then of course you have to find a way to monetize eventually. So different topic, I won't touch on that today, but very important for the future is now because we have mobile devices and we're always connected to the internet, which is good one way or the other or, or bad one way or the other. But in any case, now we're always connected, so now we can share where we are if we want. And that becomes a really interesting angle of what is adding to people's life. I don't do it very much, but I do it, for example, here to show people that I'm here and they can connect me through Facebook. I wouldn't do it when I'm just off somewhere on vacation, obviously. Um, so the most popular way of doing this, of course, Foursquare. You saw, I think, uh, the CEO yesterday. And Facebook Places. Okay, as of yesterday, 606 million people on Facebook and 12.8 billion minutes spent a day on Facebook. Every sixth page view is a Facebook page on the internet. So Facebook is becoming like infrastructure. Facebook is the next Google, probably bigger than the next Google. 
So using Facebook places, we can connect with people who are actually here, which is of course again fantastic for concerts and events. Because we can see who they are and we can also get in touch with them. And that's just now starting this process of actually using places. Here's an example from the Gap store. I'll spare you this, obviously a user made video here, but not a bad thing. So the logic is really quite simple. People go to Facebook, they say, I'm here at the concert, they check in, location is broadcasted, you find people who are there and you say, you know, because you checked in now, you can come and you get a coupon for the concert download afterwards. And it doesn't always have to be entirely free, but it has to be some sort of viral process. And they become the most loyal followers you ever have. Because, of course, you already know them because they checked in with you, so they can send messages. So that whole process gets going. For example, in this case, I would ask people to download my app. So I would say, you can get a free book, but you download my app, and through the app, I can talk to them. And when I can talk to them, sooner or later, they'll buy something. So the process, again, of sort of uh, pulling things in rather than pushing stuff out. Great example. This is a bit off the wall here, but give it a try. Paywithatweet.com. I think I said yesterday, or maybe last week somewhere else, forget where it was, <laughs> sooner or later you can pay your landlord with Facebook credits. Now, what's happening here is already this, is this hotel in Cologne where you can tweet about them and you get a free beer. I've tried it myself, it works. They gave me a free beer, a free coach. Okay. So now there's people using paywithatweet.com uh, to, for example, sell books. Well, selling in the sense of giving the PDF away, but right? after you read the PDF, you buy it on Amazon. Right? So this process of promoting by giving something is already in place with paywithatweet.com. And we're going to see uh, things like that, essentially the idea of paying with attention, uh, creating a viral mechanism. And how does it work when you pay with attention? You now, you can't take attention and say, you know, you're going to buy my car with attention. But, What's happening on Facebook now is that uh, there's a development to create an alternative currency called Facebook credits. And Facebook credits you can buy and you can earn. For example, if you're a participant, you're uploading videos, you're adding lots of value, people can give you credits. Uh, there's also a site called Flatter that does something very similar. So people can come to you and they say, I li really like your stuff, you're always putting up good music and good videos for me to, to look at, give you some credits. Then you collect those credits, and then there's companies like Delta Airlines and others who are selling their stuff on Facebook. You can use them to buy an airplane ticket. So this idea of getting paid with attention is just about here. It's just about coming, and uh, for example, what people are widely doing now on Twitter is that if you follow this hotel, they tweet something to say, okay, today we have a sale in New York. It's 80% off on this hotel, but it's only the first five people that click on the link. It's a very, very powerful mechanism of following people that generates business. So, uh, another thing that goes with this is the complete convergence of online and offline, which again could have rather difficult implications as well, uh, because now it's becoming a luxury to be offline. <laughs> it's kind of perverse when we think about 10 years ago, it was a luxury to be online. But in any case, uh, today you would see these kind of things the real life liking, so to speak, that connects with the internet. So in other words, you can be somewhere at a concert, an event, or meet somebody or so, and you can like that event or that person or whatever in real life and will show up on your website as you're doing it, using the mobile phone. Here's an example from Israel. There's one thing teenagers wait for when summer comes. Coca-Cola Village. The village hosts thousands of teenagers for three unforgettable days that integrate music, friends, and fun. This year, 
the village's site was hosted on Facebook to promote great interaction and broad exposure amongst teenagers. And still, we looked for a fresh way to create excitement. The solution? Bringing the virtual world of Facebook into the real world of the village. Every village guest received a wristband holding an RFID microchip that contained their Facebook username and password. On each village attraction, we attached an RFID microchip capable of collecting the user's data and sending it directly back to Facebook, creating a real-time sharing experience for the guests with their Facebook friends. So you go down the slide, you like the slide, they say like. Then your Facebook page says, I like the slide and the fun part. People are saying, Where, what is the fun part? They click on the link, they go to the fun part, say, oh, I'll go there tomorrow. That's how it works. So this is very powerful for music, obviously liking music, not just on the web, but in real life events, if that's going to be a standard. So you're going to say to your friend, if you like this, if you like this song as you're playing it, push the like button. And it goes out like this and spreads across Twitter, Facebook, all these platforms to create like a wave of promotional activity. This is why it's so important that you, co you don't consider online and offline to be two different places. They're not. Right? They're actually completely converging. So, fishing where the fish are. Obviously, Facebook is the biggest broadcaster in the world. Facebook's like the highway of the internet now. Imagine if the highways weren't working, we'd all be you know, trying to take a uh, to take a plane or something, and Facebook is very much, if Facebook went away today, there'd be hundreds of million people saying, what in the world is this? It's like, you know, I'm stranded. So that becomes a mechanism, of course, of what's called social commerce. That sounds like an antidote, but it's essentially the idea of selling stuff through Facebook to your friends. For example, you can buy airline tickets already on Facebook, you can buy flowers, Last year, $5 billion worth of virtual stuff was purchased, not on Facebook, but all over the internet. So people send virtual flowers, they send gift cards, $5 billion worth of stuff that doesn't actually exist. Like a tractor on Farmville, it's bizarre. So how come these people aren't buying music? That we have to figure that out. But uh, setting shop up on Facebook tickets and so on, that is going to be clearly a way forward. And it's actually very simple to do. So there has to be a process of how you figure this out, of course, using Facebook credits. Uh, here's a site called Eventbrite. Eventbrite, I think the turnover was $200 million last year. They organize events on the web where people can sign up and buy tickets or register to go there and so on. And they have this complete viral mechanism to where I put the event widget on my website, a little bit like what Topspin is doing, and then I can click through, I can generate a wave of support and then sell the tickets through the social process. So social commerce is a very, very big keyword now. Many people are predicting that pretty much uh, at least half of commerce will shift to some sort of group-related activity, uh, to what Seth Godin calls tribal business. So basically say, I buy what you recommend because you're my friends, I trust your opinion, word of mouth, and that's of course extremely powerful for music. So that mechanism has to be cultivated. It's, uh, something that's going to happen. So you heard a lot about the cloud the last two days. Thankfully, there aren't any real clouds here right now, which is good. But cloud computing. What is cloud computing? It was really quite simple. Everything we use to carry around, our records, our media, our you know, bank card, our data, is all moving into the cloud to where we can access it from different devices. This, of course, a huge threat to music and a huge opportunity, because what it means is that if all the music is in the cloud, then I don't have the same process of paying for it because it's, it's, I just run a pipeline into it. And of course, sharing just goes crazy because I can give you access to my cloud. Right? So there's lots and lots of issues about this, but basically what's happening is that cloud computing is, is, is a great way for small companies to save costs. When I did my first startup, or my, my, no, my third startup of music called License Music, it cost us over $100,000 a month to host the stuff that we were doing. Now you go to Amazon, cloud services it's called, you can get started for $2. You can use all of their fancy servers for $2. And you pay what you actually use, you don't have to buy anything. So the cloud service, for example, if you have any media stuff, you can easily do that now on the cloud. You don't have to buy your own service using this sort of concept that people have 
cooked up. I think the most popular, of course, Google is entirely based on the cloud. Uh, Salesforce.com, anybody here use Salesforce? Okay. If you're selling anything, Salesforce starts, I think, at $5 or so a month. You can put all your information and contacts, all your sales leads and stuff into Salesforce.com and everybody can access them through the web remotely and edit and so on and streamline the process of selling. So Salesforce.com is a really great company for this. The web is the platform. Amazon, of course, for media files and so on. So just remember this. Everything is moving into the cloud. It's, it's a great way to save costs for businesses, but also to share and generate information. Now, if you're in the music business, one thing that most people don't do is they don't monitor their brand. They monitor their sales. That's a big problem because not everything translates into sales. That should, obviously. Or well, there's a disconnect between intention and buying. There's many of those. But you have to start monitoring your brand. Here's an example of what Gatorade is doing to monitor their brand. say this is vastly expensive. Of course, Gatorade is doing it the expensive way, but it's not. It's actually very cheap. There's hundreds of tools now that allow you to monitor what people are saying about your band, your label, yourself, if you're interested in tracking yourself. Uh, these kind of things are becoming average, just like Google Analytics for web pages. So you can use various tools. I love this tool, for example, called Twingly. It really allows me, I put in my name, and it gives me this whole stream of what people are saying about me in different places, including Facebook, Twitter, and so on, to monitor the conversation. This is, of course, uh, this is actually becoming an A&R tool. Lots of people are going online to see what the web is saying about the band before they sign it. Which is another reason why you should have a buzz, right? Because if nobody's saying anything, you don't exist, uh, virtually speaking. So there's this great tool here, uh, because in the end, this is my, one of my constant pitches in the music business, data is the new oil. That's where success is going to be driven. I can't talk much about this, just Google it, you find out more. Uh, there's a great tool that Denzel, is Denzel here? Denzel Fibelson who runs AWOL, he's a good friend. Uh, he has a new product called buzzdeck.com that does all of this for music. It's a fantastic tool and it's available you know, for a really, really good uh, deal or something, but it's basically working out great. So. That's something you've got to get, something like this. There's many others, including, of course, free stuff on the web. Next point. Um, two years ago, I think it was, three years ago, I took EasyJet. <coughs> EasyJet, well, once you're on board on EasyJet, it's cool. But until you get there, it's a, it's a nightmare, right? Because nobody gives a damn about whether you live or die as you enter the plane. But people on the planes, like Southwest Airlines, you know, they make jokes and they're nice people, so that's okay. But until you get there, it's like, okay, so I couldn't help myself, so I tweeted about this, you know, I took photos of this boarding procedure, everybody was going like, you know, pushing themselves to get on the plane and trying to get in with a speedy boarding that isn't speedy and so on. So we had this conversation, so I posted this and EasyJet got back to me, right, and I keep this conversation until now. Happening all the time on Twitter, EasyJet is saying to me, how was your last flight? They're tracking what I do. They're actually tracking my flights and then talking to me on Twitter about if things have been getting better. So that is basically having real conversations with people who have opinion about what you do. No matter what it is, that, that's becoming crucial. Of course, you can't do that with every person. But the process of doing this, for example, Dell Computers now has 27 people that do nothing but Twitter. 27 people who are Twittering with customers about problems. And they've junked all the public relations people and put them onto Twitter. That is what's called CRM, Customer Relationship Management. So if you have a publishing company, a label, a club, or whatever, you need to get into this, that is where the conversation is happening. And it's public. It's a public conversation. 
So now if you go to EasyJet, if you go search on Twitter.com and you put an EasyJet, I come up with this conversation. And people can say, well, they're really talking to good. They can't be that foolish after all. Right? So there's a benefit that comes out of the public conversation. This is a key word, I think, for the next couple of years called transmedia storytelling. And really what it means is a quite simple uh, definition. It's a story that unfolds across multiple platforms. It's perfectly suited for music. So people are contributing stuff like video clips, uh, mobile pieces, text, uh, also games and so on to create a story around a release of a record or an artist. The most uh, successful examples, of course, uh, this is a film called Low Lives that was entirely generated by the conversation of people using submitting clips and, and creating a whole multimedia story around it. Of course, the original example is The Matrix, which had lots and lots of spin-offs, including the Animatrix, which led to a huge amount of publicity about the film The Matrix, because it was generating a platform to have conversation that was a lot more than just video. So that's a trend for the future. Bring me to this very important trend called crowdsourcing. Anybody heard about crowdsourcing? Okay. Great. Uh, crowdsourcing is really a very simple idea. It's saying that uh, there's probably lots of people out there who can help you with what you need, but you don't know who they are. So what's happening now around the world, because we're connected, we can shout out to people and say, I'm going to Singapore. What is the best place for a gig? And if you're connected in a network, they will respond and will connect you with people in Singapore to actually help you. So crowdsourcing is a process that you see around the web. This is a company called Local Motors. This is the hottest thing in cars. Local Motors builds all of their cars together through virtual collaboration on the internet. So 60,000 people are now building cars together. The car enthusiasts, obviously. And the cars are built in factories around the world where people who have built their own car together with others on the web can pick it up. Right? Crowdsourced car design. The design doesn't, nobody owns the design, nobody owns the brand of car. Local Motors owns, of course, the final product. They have to buy it, it's not cheap. But you feel like you've given birth to the car together. And it's a very powerful movement, it's a great example of crowdsourcing. Many websites like Idea Connection, where you can do this, uh, Procter & Gamble has a site where they pick up idea. There's a movie called Iron Sky that has raised all the money for the production to the fans on a crowdsourcing platform. So, so you can raise money, but it's not always easy to raise money. As we've seen, Public Enemy didn't quite work out until they decreased it. But it's an interesting tool. For example, Pledge Music is a website where people are raising money for music productions. And it's really growing. It's growing. I mean, Salo Band did this, of course, years ago. That was the first site. And that wasn't entirely easy. But this thing is actually working. And Salo Band, I think, will make a comeback. There's a great book on this. If you want to read more about it, it's called Crowdsourcing by Jeff Ho from Wired that you should check out. It talks about how that process works. Um, Starbucks co is collecting ideas from the users. The Starbucks the CEO said the other day that most of the innovation at Starbucks is coming from the users themselves. They don't have R&D in-house anymore because they're just listening to what people are saying on these websites and what they're contributing. So that's a great way of looking at it. Here's a site called Kickstarter. Anybody know Kickstarter? You can go there, you can put up a project and say, I need $2,000. You send your fans there, they send others there, people contribute 50, whatever they want to contribute. It's a fundraising process that if it's popular, you can raise money on the, on the range of 1,000 to 10,000 sort of range through a site like this, a crowdsourcing, a crowdfunding site called Kickstarter. So let me summarize, and then we're going to take some questions. We have a bit more time because we don't have a session afterwards. You can ask questions. Point one by one, make it sound different. Give it some sort of name. If you have a sushi restaurant and say, come please and eat cold dead fish, that's not very good marketing. It may still be good, but it's a bad headline. So think of a good way of selling what you do. That's crucial. Cloud computing. If you run a small business, get into the cloud, save costs, put your stuff in the cloud, because that's a trend we're going to see in the future. And as of course, every single day at BLM here, we hear about how music is moving into the cloud and access is replacing the copy, which sounds scary, but that's where it's going. 
So we have to deal with that and figure out new business models. Kickstarter and raising money for your fans. I would warn against being too optimistic with this. Okay, because it's one thing to like somebody, the other one is to spend money. It works sometimes and it's worth trying, but don't be disappointed if it doesn't work. There's lots of reasons for that. It's not because people hate you, it's just maybe it wasn't the right timing or something. So uh, it's worth looking at, but it's not sort of the panacea there. Humor. This works great, of course, for everything you're trying to publish. People read humorous stuff a lot quicker than the other stuff. So if you have some humor, you can find it somewhere, acquire it, then use it. Uh, I have 2,785 posts on my website, mediafuturist.com. Guess what the most popular page on my entire blog is, which is running, you know, I get about 10,000 a month or so. I've been running for, for seven years. The most popular post is a post about the biggest pizza in the world that has broke the Guinness Book of Records. Because somebody put this funny image up and that's what everybody's finding. So, you know, that gives an example that anything that's funny or viral or interesting will get you more traffic. Become a lovable brand. I always say to, when I work with publishers and record labels, uh, engage, don't enrage, because the music industry is very good at enraging. Uh, suing our customers and so on. Of course, that's a very successful strategy, as we can see. So, uh, become a lovable brand. That is the key because people will do anything. If you have a product that they love, if they love what you do, they love you as a person or as a company, they can feel what you're about, they will buy stuff. That's not a theory. If you're looking around the web, this is Google's biggest problem. If we start to use trust, uh, to lose our trust in Google, we stop using them, and then they're dead. So that's crucial to keep trust and develop this sort of relationship. Be different. I mean, of course, this is quite clearly so for artists, you know. You don't just have to be good, you also have to be different. You have to stand for something. That's what you can remember after the fact. Crucial. Get into location-based services. Facebook places, Foursquare, and so on. That is definitely going to explode. There's lots and lots of issues about this, privacy issues. Do I want to share? Do I really want people to know what I'm doing, where I am? I don't know, but this is a very, very big thing for commerce. Because 78% of people buy stuff because of a social connection. Word of mouth. Somebody else saying, you should do this, and then they'll do it. So obviously, social commerce, location-based services, mobile, clearly, Mobilize anything. I, I would say that in a couple of years from now, everything we used to do on the web will fade away and move onto mobile platforms or merge, as we can see with HTML5. Try to shoot for the viral effect. Easier said than done. But if you don't give anything, you're not going to get anything. So keep that in mind that that is how that process works. Uh, that's how you get it started. Uh, get used to the fact that um, probably most stuff that we know will move what's called over the top. On top of this is Google TV. So the complete convergence of television and the internet, that's also very good for artists because it allows, allows on-demand services. You can check that out. Think of yourself as a broadcaster. You're sending out stuff, even if you're just a one-man band or a label. You have to broadcast stuff to get stuff back. Mobile first, we discussed this already. I want to end with this because I think this is our problem. Every time I come to the meeting, which is now 18 times, sounds sad, um, I hear these discussions about people saying, you know, we're really just to try and maximize profit. You know, that's, you know, that's basically, so if your intention only is to maximize profit in the quickest possible way and not care about other people's profit, I, don't, I think we're dead. Because we're not generating enough network effect to bring people our way. So in the music business, I think if we take the series, create more value than you capture, we'll be very successful. And that's really what innovation is all about. So I want to thank you for listening. I do have an iPhone app and an Android app from Media Futurist. That's my dog. Um, and you can add me on Facebook. If you add me on Facebook, please tell me who you are or how we met. Otherwise, there's too many I can't respond to all at the same time. So just say keyword meet them so we can connect. Now I'm ready for some questions. Uh, if you go to mediafuturist.com sometime this afternoon, you can download this thing.
not the dog, just the PDF, uh, and uh, go from there. I have about 100 hours of video on my website called GertTube. Uh, GertTube.net is where you can connect to iTunes. You can download all the videos and, and never watch them, uh, whatever you like to do. So do we have any questions? Well, I just keep monologuing. There's a question. Oh, there's been lots and lots and lots of that. I mean, of course, Nine Inch Nails is really the best example. I mean, lots of bands are using sort of game-like environments to generate attention. Um, so you can download a Flash game or you can download an app. I think this is something that's really exploding now on Facebook. If you're looking at uh, social games like Farmville, that is by far the most popular place to introduce a track. A Facebook game to allow your track being used with a link back to your website. Those kind of things are happening all over the web. It's not entirely easy to figure out whether you should get paid or do it for free and how. That's really a question of leverage, obviously. But uh, there was a great study from um, Mike Mesnick last year about Trent Reznor's Nine Inch Nails campaign using gaming, multimedia, that whole approach to creating a fan. That's probably the best example. Um, there's a video on this on, on the video net site about last year's presentation. Another question? I'll, I'll just keep adding. Now there's a question. Uh, if you let me talk, I will be here tonight, so. <laughs> uh, is, well, you, you talked about a lot of uh, techniques, and there's a lot of tools, like, uh, there's really like hundreds of tools on the internet for this. But at the end of the day, uh, and you said it at one moment uh, during your speech, we'll have to figure out how to monetize this. Because, uh, I mean, you know, like Twitter or YouTube or these companies can, 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 go, can afford to go for like 10 years and say, well, we'll figure out how to monetize this one day or then. But if you're an independent artist, you can, <laughs> you can go on for 10 years for that. At the end of the day, you have to make a living. So, uh, like during the medium, uh, I hear, uh, I've heard of a lot of uh, strategies and new startups, and it's like nobody has a business model. Everybody has amazing ideas, but at the end, but everybody says, well, "We'll figure out. We'll figure out." But I mean, do you have? <laughs> is there yeah. something concrete? Well, of course, at the end I know the question. I, I hear it all the time. I wish I had an answer, but but the the reality is really quite simple. Like, we live in a world where the planning of money is no longer as certain as it was 20 years ago. In other words, we can't sit down and say, okay, here's my business plan, my spreadsheet, and just put in money, out comes the other end, comes the profit. And that, that was 30 years ago. Now we live in a world where the plan is already gone by the time you launch your website, there's already a new reality. So if we think that we can make a plan or we can monetize before we have something to monetize, that's of course a big problem. So for a lot of companies, this is a huge issue, obviously, because if you know the term ROI, return on investment, that is the Bible of business. You calculate what you do, out comes the ROI, you make money or you don't make money, you don't do it. But now on the web, because people are connected and moving very quickly, it's, what I, it's changing into what I call return on engagement. Right? So you figure out a mechanism of building an audience. When you have an audience that's loyal and that's connected, that's when you start thinking about conversion. So the issue is really one of leverage. Uh, in other words, if you're unknown, it's all free anyway. Because you can't charge. You play free gigs, you give your music away, you do whatever it takes. As you move up the food chain, maybe you can get paid for a gig. And then you move up further, maybe your music is used in a motion picture. Right, so you have to gain leverage. And if you don't have leverage, you'll never make any money. And that's obviously the capitalist rule of the day. Right? But on the web, that really hasn't changed, except that you can gain leverage quicker, possibly, if you're good at it. Um, however, you know, last year I spoke about how the monetizing works. I think there's many new mechanisms that are coming. We're in the situation where we have to just face the reality that selling copies is probably over. So once we start saying that is true, 
then we can start looking in different directions how we can sell it. Some of those include, for example, flat rates, bundles, advertising services, on-demand services, HD delivery, premiums, and so on and so on. There's many, many new ideas. But we have to, we have to create those new models. They're not just going to fall from, from the sky. I mean, we can't just go to Google or to Vodacom or Vodafone or, and say, guys, time to pay. It's not that simple. There's an ecosystem that we have to generate. We have to create a logic. I mean, just to give you, I don't want to get too far out of this, but just to give you a ballpark figure, you know, one trillion dollars a year is, is spent on advertising. So 550 million billion on reaching people and about uh, the rest of it used for marketing, promotional, public relations, and all the other stuff that we don't want to know about. So roughly one trillion dollars. Don't you think if a service like Spotify, I don't, do you think if they would launch and they would get enough users to be loyal users, they could use that advertising money to pay for our music? Easy. Because the advertiser needs access to us. That's the Google model. So I believe advertising hasn't done it so far, but it will, because now it's moving to the mobile, and it's always been that about 70% of all content was funded by advertising. So that's definitely a way forward, and of course what I call third